This episode of Six Five Guys is brought to you by JC Still Targets, Defiance Machine, Arbro's Rifles. Welcome to another episode of Six Five Guys. Hi, I'm Steve Lawrence. And I'm Ed Mobley. And I'm really excited because today is range day. We get to do some load development. It certainly is. Now, this is episode two of our two-part episode on load development. So if you, have, if you haven't seen episode one, be sure to check that out because we're actually utilizing a method and an approach that was shared with us by our friend Scott Satterley. And Ed's done a lot of work right up front. So do you want to kind of walk us through uh, a little bit what, about what we can expect for this episode? Yeah, I'm going to be testing out some 123 CNRs with both H4350 and Varget. And then I'm also going to be testing out some 139 CNRs with H4350 to get those dialed in. Awesome. All right, so here we go, guys. Check it out. So we get into the first phase, step one of the approach that we have. Tell us a little bit about the tool. Yeah, so this is the, the Hornady tool, and you'll notice that the cartridge on there, it's a 6.5 uh, by 47 cartridge that is fired in a chamber using the same reamer and provided to us by our gunsmith. Hornady doesn't make one for the 6.5 by 47, but even if you're shooting a cartridge where Hornady makes that particular cartridge, you get a better fit if you can get one made by your gunsmith that's been fired in the in your cha chamber. In your chamber, yes. Yeah. Yes, and so this is a very nice, nice fit. Now, um, once you have it screwed on with a bullet, in this case, um, which bullet are you using? I think that's the 123 CNR. Okay, you feed in it into the chamber, and then what are you doing here? I'm just pushing it in very, very lightly, because if you push in too hard, you can get a 10,000th uh, variation. Okay. And then I use a wooden dowel. This is a trick that our gunsmith uh, taught me where you, you push it back again and you, you do it several times until you, you get the feeling that you're just kissing the lands. Yeah. So the wrong approach is just shoving it in there and jabbing it into the lands and then screwing down. You actually want it just kissing the yeah, lands. Yeah, just kissing. And if you, if you look here, you'll see that I'm using my thumb and index finger and I'm pushing forward where there's hardly any friction. You see that, that, that I mean, very little force. Yep. And then screwing it down. And I'll show later on the, the difference between pressing on it gingerly like that mm -hmm. versus really mashing it in. Okay. And then, of course, I use the, the dowel. Now to push the tool out. Right, because otherwise the, the, the bullet, even though it's just kissing the land, sometimes will get, will get stuck in there. And then what you do is you measure it. And uh, we have another tool. I think we actually show this other tool in our seating depth we do. Uh, episode. So you're measuring the distance from the base to the ogive. Right. And so here it's 2.122. But now what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you what happens if you really press hard. You'll... you'll get up to 2.134 and that's just the difference between you know pressing at the end of that stem with my thumb mm -hmm. versus just Jamming using using my thumb and index finger. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we get to the next step. Which this is, is an that, alternative if you don't yeah. have the, that Hornady tool. Right. If you don't have the Hornady tool, Scott had described this approach in the first episode of this specific series where I'm loading up uh, cartridges and I'm incrementing my seating die by one increment for each load, or approximately five one thousandths. Um, after I load up 10 cartridges, I actually take a Sharpie and write down what the overall length of each cartridge is using that same Hornady tool. Um, and then uh, that allows me to track which of these cartridges at different seating depths are going to touch the lands. But given the choice, I mean, the, the Hornady tool is a much more accurate. It is. Yeah. yeah. And that tool is about $35, so it's really not that big of an investment. Right. So, so how do you tell if whether your bullet is actually touching lands? Well, we take a 
Sharpie or a felt tip marker and I'm basically coloring the jacket of each bullet. Um, once I have those colored for the tin cartridges, the next step is to actually chamber them. And then after each time it gets extracted, I look at the bullet and look for evidence of whether or not it was touching the lands and grooves. Now I mentioned earlier I was just kissing the lands. That's because we're shooting VLDs. Yep. But if you're doing a hybrid bullet or something with a traditional OJ, it really won't matter. Then you'll start with the twenty thousand soft. Yeah. So here, here I am actually loading the rounds using my uh, Dillon 550. We're going to be doing a video on that later on because it's, it's really sped up my reloading process and it creates precision ammo. So here I am, I charge the powder, I use my toothbrush, and again I'm not putting that back in my mouth, don't worry about it, to vibrate down the powder. And then I, I seat the bullet, and as I seat the bullet of course I'll be charging powder in the in the in other the, case yeah in, in the other case and then so you're creating five cartridges for each that's correct one at increments of what powder um, it, it, it depends some were 0.2 some were 0.3 yeah now this is just uh again um doing it the classic way I actually my approach is to use the loading block but again you know i load five cartridges um each uh with different increments or, or five cartridges of the same amount of powder but in different increments across five five cartridges so here i am at the range at the range doing my thing now i'm shooting off a bench here but i find out that shooting on your belly prone is is the most accurate and consistent because even sitting on the bench you can still get a bit of yeah now again uh with this test um consistency is everything so the recommendation for this step is to test your string of cartridges for um, each load increment uh, without breaking your position. Correct. So you'll notice here Ed's using some really good form, not breaking cheek weld, keeping his eye on the target. And it always helps to have a buddy when you're doing this, um, when you're chronographing, because I found that it can be a little bit distracting at times. Um, I want to actually look at the chronograph, right? You're right. going to probably break your cheek weld, um, uh, move your hand on the rear bag, and so on. You can see the concussion, how that, yeah. that moved the, the, the camera there. But even you know, with what looks to be good form, again, you still have that human element. And when we analyze the targets here, there are a couple of groups where the, the flyers, you know, it's what Scott said. Is it truly a flyer, or is it attributable to the to the proverbial nut behind the trigger? Yeah. Now, as you're as we're uh, firing these and chronographing, um, in this case, we're using a Magneto Speed uh, V2 uh, with the V1 uh, control unit. Right. But um, what's nice about this is even if you don't have a buddy there um, to record your velocities this tool will actually save it to a little mini SD card you can take Correct. that and download it Correct. Um, in this instance I was actually helping Ed um, not only recording his notebook but um, telling him how each round is performing from a velocity standpoint that's a flattering shot right there and I I it's interesting some of that I don't know if they're nervous ticks or what as I <laughs> as I sort of get uh, Concentration. Uh, yeah, <laughs> concentration. But yeah, it's just the, the things you discover when you video yourself and, and end up watching it. I think uh, the fact that you know, you've spent a lot of time behind the trigger, you're, you're really concentrating on you know, getting off a, a good shot. You, know, you see you're not blinking after each shot is fired. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I look at it, I mean, the follow-through seems good, I'm not moving. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm doing a nice slow squeeze, so it's a true surprise break. I know some people say you shouldn't be surprised, but again, you just, you don't want to be startled. Yeah. Okay, so, so here we go. Yeah, this is phase three, we're doing analysis, we're going to look at our groups and try and identify, you know, which groups do we really like. I, I particularly try to look at vertical um, variation uh, and, and don't focus so much on the horizontal or windage variation. But again, some of that vertical stringing on the 42 grain 
I mean, that could very well be me. But the thing you have to realize, the biggest problem we have is all these groups are good. Yeah. And and so when we look at the data right here, the the data indicates that 42 grains seems to be the the optimal load. Yeah. Lowest standard deviation, lowest extreme spread. And when you look at the curve, you know, it's getting down there towards a flat spot. Um, but you're just correlating that with the actual uh, target. You know, there was it was a pretty good group. Now here's one with Varget and the 123 CNARS. And you look at that 38.3 group. I was having some trouble with the rear bag. And this goes back to what Scott said. There is clearly a bunch of human error in that particular group, you know, when you mm -hmm. look at the, the other groups. And so with the 38 grain load, I had a little bit of bolt stickiness. So I would probably go with 37.7. But when you look at the data, it, it indicates that 37.7 is really that the, the sweet spot. Too. Well, I'm seeing Varget is very consistent. I mean, All over. Yeah, I mean, not only were those good groups. Now, keep in mind that, you know, those targets, um, that's a grid of 0.1 mil at 100 yards or 0.36 inch per line on that. that. Mm -hmm. Now, here are the 139 CNARs, and they just seem to shoot very, very uh accurately again you'll you'll see a flyer here or there mm -hmm. i honestly believe that that's me but when when we look at the the data you you see a a, a nice clear indication of an optimal group yeah here you know you'll you'll see that the 39.8 i mean that's a standout on, on this chart um, when we looked at the 39.6, um, that looked, from a group standpoint, really good, but purely from the analytics, I think the reason why the numbers are off is you do have one uh, outlier. Right. And if you reshot it, maybe it, it would be smaller. But again, that, that 39.8, just based on the data, seems like a solid group. And if I were to have, if I, if, if I had a load for a Tomorrow, that's yeah. what I would go with. Now, this is something you shot with the 123 CNRs a number of months ago. Different rifle, different lot of powder, suppressor. Yeah, and I ended up with the same results. And I just wanted to show something that kind of corroborates the testing that Ed had done. I'd done a very similar test to this early in the year uh, with my uh, first Arboros rifle. And ended up basically with the same results. 42 um, grains. Yeah, same load. Now, um, you know, Phase four didn't really talk about, but that gets us towards um, refining this. So that's something to keep in mind that, you know, once you find the ideal load, you'll want to take a look at perhaps uh, optimizing using seeding depth variation. That was really an interesting test here at the range today, Ed. Yeah, so we've come away with the information we need to have some solid loads with the 123 CNRs and the 139 CNRs. And because we have the same rifle, we'll be yep. able to share those loads. Really the only thing we'll have to worry about going forward are some of the lot-to-lot -lot variations in powder. We'll have to adjust for that. And then we may want to optimize the seating depth. I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll see how they shoot. Right. So we have found our accuracy nodes. You know, there is step four in Scott's load development methodology, which is to go ahead and, and do the fine tuning with the seating depth. And uh, we'll see if that yields any additional improvement in those accuracies. I mean, if, if, if we're shooting bug holes, we'll, we'll, we'll probably call it good because yeah. as you shoot the rifle, things are gonna change anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it is what it is. So we'll keep you apprised. Guys, if you found this episode and episode one interesting as well, please like, share, and if you, if you haven't subscribed, do that as well. And definitely check out our website because that's where we have a detailed write-up and other ancillary information uh, pertaining to these uh, videos and, and all of our videos. That's right. Remember guys, life's an adventure. Stay on target.